Good afternoon, and welcome to the 13th year of the Draper Museum of Natural History's Lunchtime Expedition Series. Dr. Preston sends his regards and regrets that he cannot be here today, but I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. He came to the Buffalo Bill Historical Center from Philadelphia, where he headed several institutions. Prior to that, he was employed by the Smithsonian Institution for 11 years. He currently holds the position of Senior Curator of Western History and the Buffalo Bill Museum at the BBHC and is also Vice President of Cody's Metal Ark Audubon Society. He has maintained a lifelong interest in birds and nature and is especially interested in the history of nature conservation. Please welcome Dr. John Rum. Thank you, Bonnie, and uh, hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because I am fighting a cold, and I'm not doing very well fighting it. Uh, so bear with me. I hope you'll be able to hear me. If not, let me know. Uh, I would ask if you would take a moment to um, turn off or silence your cell phones so it won't distract people around you. I'd appreciate that. And while you're doing that, I'll, this, uh, I deliberately chose the title of this presentation to reflect this book of Rachel Carson's, which of all of the books that she wrote is my favorite. But I, I think it reflects who she was. Um, she had an affinity for nature, and that filled her with uh, humility and a sense of wonder, qualities which she lived by and which she sought to instill in others through her writing. And you'll see this sense of wonder and humility come through again and again as, as we go through this presentation. There's another side to it, though. She wasn't simply interested in nature for its own sake, but she was really concerned, especially as she aged, about what was happening to the world around her because of mankind. As she said, wonder and humility are wholesome emotions and they do not exist side by side with a lust for destruction. So those are really kind of kindred themes, this uh, sense that she had of wondering humility, coupled with her concerns, her increasing concerns about the fate of our planet. So we all need a heroine or a hero. It's a wonderful cartoon by Charles Schultz, a Peanuts cartoon. If you can't read it, it says uh, Lucy there with Schroeder, Rachel Carson says that when our moon was born, there were no oceans on Earth. And Schroeder says, Rachel Carson, Rachel, Rachel Carson, Rachel Carson. You're always talking about Rachel Carson. And she says, we girls need our heroines. Now, that's kind of a telling commentary because, frankly, in the 1950s, when this cartoon was published, there weren't a lot of role models for women, particularly women in science. And, uh, and so that's kind of a, a pointed statement about that. So how many of you are familiar with Rachel Carson? Great. Can you tell me a couple of things about her? Anybody? What, what's that? DDT? Good for you. Good for you. It, it is hard to find. Anything else? Well, this talk is really kind of a labor of love for me. It grows out of uh, really a lifelong interest of mine in Rachel Carson. And I hope if you, even if you are familiar with her, that this will instill in you a desire to want to know more about one person who I really think is a hero and a role model for all of us today. And speaking of today, uh, I always like to try to give people a sense of where somebody would be at this moment in time. So 50 years ago today, if we were doing this talk, what would Rachel Carson have been doing? She would have been fighting cancer. She had breast cancer, which ultimately killed her. Uh, and in the midst of everything else that was happening in her life, which I'll be talking about, she had this steely sense of resolve. As she says, I still believe in the old Churchillian determination to fight each battle as it comes. We will fight on the beaches, that famous 
speech that Churchill gave. And I think a determination to win may well postpone the final battle. It's a wonderful quote because it shows how she was a fighter. And that's another aspect of her that I think is heroic. Um, I thought about talking, titling this talk, Rachel and Me, because of the way my life has intertwined with hers. She spent the last 40 years of her life living in Silver Spring, Maryland. I spent about seven years living in Silver Spring, Maryland, not far from the house where she died that is still there today, and it now houses the Rachel Carson Council. I grew up with her books. The, uh, the Edge of the Sea was one of the first books that I ever read, and The Sea Around Us and others of her writings. So she's been a part of my life, but in a very deeply personal way. I, f I got my Ph.D. in 1989 in business and labor history. I wrote about DuPont, and I was, had several publishers that wanted to publish it, and I, I just really wasn't interested in getting it published. I was tired, and I was looking for something else to do, and I decided that I would write a biography of Rachel Carson. At that time, there weren't any biographies of her. So I was at the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian Archives had some materials, and I found out that her literary papers were at Yale and contacted them and started doing some interviews. Well, as John Lennon would say, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans, because in 1993, just as I was ready to embark on this project, my position was cut at the Smithsonian, and I transferred over to another office. Now, in that transfer, I had to give up my membership, my seat on the Smithsonian Council that awarded fellowships in the history of science and technology. And that year, they awarded a fellowship to a woman named Linda Lear, who, as it turned out, was writing a biography of Rachel Carson. Wouldn't you know but that she got my old office, my desk, and my computer and used it to write her biography. There, such as life. And it's a wonderful book. It, it's uh, really magisterial. I, you know, it's, it's like this thick. And it will tell you everything you wanted to know about Rachel Carson. And Linda's a lovely person, and I give her a lot of credit for that. But, you know, it's, it's like there but for the grace of God. So, at any rate, 50 years ago, or last year was the 50th anniversary of Rachel Carson, and that was what really inspired me to want to, uh, of, of Silver Spring, I should say, a uh, Silent Spring. And that's what really prompted me to want to pr put this presentation together, and Chuck was kind enough to ask me to do a reprise. I initially did it for Metal Arc Audubon. So, <coughs> I'm going to tell you about her biography, and as we go through, I'm also going to offer you some selections from her readings, brief selections, and again, I hope those will encourage you to want to uh, read more of them for yourself. So she was born on May 27th in 1907, a Pennsylvania girl, born in Springdale, Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. Her father had a 60-something acre farm north of Pittsburgh, and she spent a lot of time there. She spent a lot of time watching birds, and uh, just getting outdoors. She loved being in that farm. There you see her. She's right in the center on her mom's lap. She had a, an older brother and an older sister. Uh, she particularly loved the Allegheny River, which snakes through Springdale on its way down to Philadelphia. She liked the river especially because it gave her the opportunity to go to collect fossils along the riverbank. And she really liked collecting fossils and shells and listening to birds. And the point of this was she had this love of nature, which she developed at an early age and which would stay with her for the rest of her life. Uh, she also had aspirations of being a writer. And in 1918, sent a, an article into a magazine called St. Nicholas Magazine for a literary contest and wound up winning second prize, getting her... Uh, her article published, A Battle in the Clouds, about the adventures of aviators in Germany, basically it consisted of stories that had sure she had heard from her older brother who was fighting in uh, Germany. Uh, but for Rachel, as you can imagine, for a, a girl who was then 10 years old, this was just an amazing thrill to be able to, uh, to have something of hers in print and to, to just you know feel so good about that. So she had this desire to become a writer, and it would become uh, central to who she was. She uh, went to what was then called the Pennsylvania College for Women, 
now known as Chatham College in Pennsylvania. Took a lot of liberal arts courses, a lot of writing courses, English, composition, literature, things like that. And she took a zoology course from a woman named Mary Scott Skinner, Skinker. And Skinker wound up becoming her mentor. Rachel took every science course she could from this woman who in 1928 left Chatham College to go to Johns Hopkins University to get a degree in biology and Rachel would follow her there. Uh, Skinker also had an association with a place called Woods Hole in Massachusetts. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. It's on Cape Cod. It's a, a wonderful seashore area. Skinker went there, it's kind of like a summer camp, and invited Rachel Carson to go there. And in the summer of 1929, she went there, saw the ocean for the first time. And it was something she had dreamed about up till that point. She had dreamed about the sea, had dreamed about what it was like. She loved reading poetry about the sea, for example. And, and here it was. And she was astonished by it. She said, it is fair to say that my first impressions of the sea were sensory and emotional. The intellectual response came later. But from the moment she saw the sea and, and heard the ocean, heard the waves and smelled the sea and felt the animals in the tide pools, she just loved it. She was very much caught up with the sensory experiences of the ocean. There's a picture of Woods Hole. It's today the site of the Marine Oceanograf o Oceanographic Research Institute. World renowned is probably the place to go for oceanography, as it was in her time. And so by going there, and she started going there every summer from 1929 onward, she got to interact not only with the sea, but with great scientists, researchers from all over the world, and writers who were interested, as she was, in the sea. And there's a photograph of one of the tide pools at uh, Woods Hole. Have any of you ever been, have you ever been by a tide pool? If you have, you understand why the appeal is so great. It's like being in an aquarium without walls. I mean, it's all right there and you can scoop your hand down and pick up sea urchins and, and touch sea anemones and sea cucumbers. And it's just, it's an unreal experience. It's riveting as it was for her. So, as I said, her, her mentor, Skinker had gone to Johns Hopkins and Rachel Carson followed her. She enrolled at Johns Hopkins in 1930 and graduated in 1932 with a degree in zoology. And that's important because one of the criticisms that was leveled at Rachel Carson after S Silent Spring was published was that she was not a scientist. The reality was she absolutely was a scientist, trained as a scientist. And, uh, and brought that knowledge, that in-depth familiarity with science, to what she did. But it was nature, not simply the sea, but nature writ large, where she felt most at home. Um, there's no question that from an early age, she, uh, she was just fascinated by nature. But more than just observing nature, she felt a spiritual connection with it and a connection that went beyond simply indulging herself in it. It was a, a, a sense of wonder, a sense of humility that inspired her to action as the first reading selection will suggest. And this is uh, remarks that she made when she was addressing the Theta Sigma Phi sorority at their annual dinner in 1954. The creed I have lived by a preoccupation with the wonder and beauty of the earth has strongly influenced the course of my life. I have been concerned with some of the beauties and mysteries of this earth about us, and with the even greater mysteries of the life that inhabits it. I can remember no time when I wasn't interested in the out of doors and the whole world of nature. No one can dwell long among such, such subjects without thinking rather deep thoughts, without asking searching and often unanswerable questions without achieving a certain philosophy. There is one quality that characterizes all of us who deal with the sciences of the earth and its life. We are never bored. We can't be. There is always something new to be investigated. Every mystery solved brings us to the threshold of an even greater one. 
The pleasures, the values of contact with the natural world are not reserved for the scientists. They're available to anyone who will place himself under the influence of a lonely mountaintop or the sea or the stillness of a forest or who will stop to think about so small a thing as the mystery of a growing seed. I believe natural beauty has a necessary place in the spiritual development of any individual or any society. I believe that whenever we destroy beauty or whenever we substitute something man-made and artificial for a natural feature of the earth, we have retarded some part of our spiritual growth. I believe this affinity of the human spirit for the earth and its beauties is deeply and logically rooted. As human beings, we are part of the whole stream of life. Our origins are of the earth. And so there is in us a deeply seated response to the natural universe, which is part of our humanity. There is symbolic as well as actual beauty in the migration of birds, in the ebb and flow of the tides, in the folded bud ready for spring. There is something infinitely healing in these repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. I believe that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. So for her, nature was spiritual, but it was also a call to action to awaken us to the dangers of not only taking nature for granted, but of harming nature. Well, her, her growing fascination with nature and the philosophy that arose out of it, her interest in writing kind of all coalesced in 1935 when she got her first job as a junior aquatic biologist with what was then the Bureau of Fisheries, later to become part of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And she would stay with that agency until 1952, working in various positions. Uh, she was an editor, she was a speech writer, she was a writer of popular literature about uh, topics related to the ocean, and she occasionally wrote uh, press releases. Uh, here's an example of one of the publications that she wrote. You know, these were, these were scientific publications uh, directed at uh, commercial fishermen and people who were interested in fishing primarily to give them a sense of the biology of fish and of other aquatic life. But she brought to them a sense of wanting to tell a story of wanting to infuse dry science with something lifelike and something that could be the cause of wonder. And this all inspired her to be a writer about one of the things that she knew the most, which was the sea. You know, what, what better thing to write about than the thing you love the most? And so in 1937, she had actually written a radio script. I'm sorry, 1936, had written a radio script about life under the sea. And she showed it to her boss. And he sent it back to her with a big X through it. And he said, come see me. So she went down and, and said, what, what's wrong? And he said, well, actually, there's nothing wrong with this one. But I wouldn't send this to a radio. I wouldn't use this for a radio script. Send this to the Atlantic. So she did. She sent it to the Atlantic Monthly. And it was published as Undersea in September 1937. And here's a brief excerpt from that. Now, this excerpt, I think, will give you a sense of what she brought to writing about, about nature and about the sea. Who has known the ocean? Neither you nor I, with our earthbound senses, know the foam and surge of the tide that beats over the crab hiding under the seaweed of his tide pool home, or the lilt to the long, slow swells of mid-ocean, where shoals of wandering fish prey and are preyed upon, and the dolphin breaks the waves to breathe the upper atmosphere? Nor can we know the vicissitudes of life on the ocean floor, where the sunlight filtering through a hundred feet of water makes but a fleeting bluish twilight, in which dwell sponge and mollusk and starfish and coral, where swarms of diminutive fish twinkle through the dusk like a silver rain of meteors and eels lie in wait among the rocks. Even less is it given to man to descend those six incomprehensible miles into the recesses of the abyss, 
where reign utter silence and unvarying cold and eternal night. To sense this world of waters known to the creatures of the sea, we must shed our human perceptions of length and breadth and time and place and enter vicariously into a universe of all-pervading water. So right there, she's drawn you in. You know, she's writing as if she is in that world herself and is making you experience it with very vivid language, with, with lots of descriptive words and with things that relate to our sensory perceptions. And that, that is what her writing was all about. Again, this emotional response to nature, this kind of deeply felt way that it touches us. So from the reactions, the very positive reactions she got to this article, Undersea, and with the encouragement of her boss, she began to do other writing on the side, writing about the sea. And in 1941, had her first book published, Under the Sea Wind, A Naturalist Picture of Ocean Life. It was a flop. It happened to be published the same week that Pearl Harbor was bombed, and essentially it disappeared from sight. It sold less than a thousand copies. So for an aspiring writer, writing about what she knows and loves, it was a crushing blow that the book vanished. So. Carson was about ready to give up writing altogether, deciding there was no future in it. Fortunately for us, her, her cooler sense prevailed. And 10 years later, she published The Sea Around Us. How many of you know this book? It's a wonderful book. Uh, it is filled with descriptions of the sea and the life in the sea and the forces that have created the sea and keep it what it is, and our relationship to it. It's just, it's a beautiful, beautifully structured, beautifully written book. It became the basis for an award-winning documentary, and it made Carson an award-winning author. She won the John Burroughs Award for Excellence in Nature Writing. She won a National Book Award for the Best Nonfiction Book. And of course, those things would, would reify her, would, would tell her that yes, she is a writer, not only a uh, good writer, but a great writer, a writer who has the ability to change people's lives with what she does. These are some remarks that she made in 1953 after she accepted the National Book Award, and it really speaks to who she was and why writing for her was such a joy. When I planned my book, I knew that only a fascination for the sea and a compelling sense of its mystery had been part of my life since childhood. So I wrote what I knew about and also what I thought and felt about it. The notion that science is something that belongs in a separate compartment of its own, apart from everyday life, is one that I should like to challenge. We live in a scientific age. Yet we assume that knowledge of science is the prerogative of only a small number of human beings, isolated and priest-like in their laboratories. This is not true. The materials of science are the materials of life itself. Science is part of the reality of living. It is the what, the how and the why of everything in our experience. The aim of science is to discover and illuminate truth. And that, I take it, is the aim of literature whether it be biography or history or fiction, it seems to me then that there can be no separate literature of science. My own guiding purpose was to portray the subject of my sea profile with fidelity and understanding. All else was secondary. The winds, the sea, and the moving tides are what they are. If there is wonder and beauty and majesty in them, science will discover these qualities. If they are not there, science cannot create them. If there is poetry in my book about the sea, it is not because I deliberately put it there, but because no one could write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. So that really tells you something of who she was. Probably the best thing for her that came out of that National Book Award, uh, that, the honors that she had received for um, the sea around us, was a Guggenheim Fellowship, which she got 
uh, to study tidal life at where else? Woods Hole in Massachusetts. And so with that prize and with the money associated with it, she abandoned her job with the government, gave it up to devote herself full time to writing, and spent about four years doing field work at Woods Hole, also down in Florida, uh, in Maine, all along the eastern coast. She was working on a book about the, uh, the tides and the margins of the seashores. And that became The Edge of the Sea, published in 1955. Again, just a beautiful, beautiful book, focusing on three seashores in particular that she knew, a uh, Florida mangrove swamp, a uh, rocky beach off the coast of North Carolina, and seashores up in Maine. It uh, became an almost immediate bestseller, and as had The Sea Around Us, which when this was published in 1955 was still on the bestseller charts. And Carson had the rare privilege, I'm not sure that many other authors have had this, of seeing two books of hers on the bestseller list, New York Times bestseller list at the same time. So what a, what a tribute to her as an author. In 1956, at the request of Ladies Home Companion, she published an essay, an article, called The Sense of Wonder, about introducing children to nature. This was published as a book after her death in 1965. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's my favorite of her books. You spoke to, to it also, and, and it's a powerful statement. I'll share with you just a brief excerpt from it. You may have heard this before. A child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that for most of us, that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed and even lost before we reach adulthood. If I had influence with a good fairy who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantment of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the sources of our strength. I mean, there it is, in a nutshell. That, that's her philosophy writ large. This sense of wonder that permeates, permeated who she was, and she wanted so badly to share that with everybody, children and adults, and to remind adults that the more removed we are from nature, the more alienated we are from it, the more we're alienated from the source of everything that makes us human. So this is all happening in the, the 1950s. How many of you remember the 1950s? Live through it, you know, this picture kind of captures it all. The nuclear family, mom and dad and junior sitting around and watching a TV set. Uh, a time of innocence. Life was great. You know, Norman Rockwell wrote or painted all sorts of paintings about life in the 1950s, and we look back on it fondly with lots of nostalgia. TV dinners and dad washing the car while mom is washing the windows, and there's everybody out on a picnic. You know, it's just, it was a wonderful time, a time of innocence. But we all know that it really had a sinister side to it also, that all of us who lived through the 1950s and into the 60s and 70s had this specter hanging over us, this prospect of annihilation, the prospect of the end of life as we know it. But there was also, at the same time, a sense that science would see us through, that science would triumph, that science would cure all of the ills of society and bring us to a golden age even far more golden than what we knew of the 50s. This is a, um, an exhibit that was done for the DuPont Company at the World's Fair in 1939, Better Living Through Chemistry. Better things, better living through chemistry. The, the promise of this utopian society that science, and in particular the chemical sciences, would bring us. And here's another display from uh, the World's Fair of 1939. Science fights nature's thieves. All those nasty critters, the bugs the, that prey on our food crops, that uh, give us 
mosquito-borne diseases that are making life miserable for us, science can eradicate them. Science is doing the battle for us. And just as we took it to the bad guys during World War I, and as we're about to take it to the bad guys as we're approaching a second world war, we didn't know that, of course, but, but this faith in science to bring about a golden life for us was pervasive. One of the things that emerged out of this uh, faith in science was the discovery, not the discovery of DDT, because that had been discovered actually in the 1870s, but the discovery that DDT was a potent insecticide. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce DDT. You can read the, uh, the words up there for yourself. Uh, but it was discovered in the late 30s that it could be a very potent um, and powerful agent against insects. And this is, uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just in a, a, a quick primer on some things about DDT, some facts you should know. It was first introduced to the United States in 1943. Uh, it was used by the military during and after the war. They would uh, go into an area and eradicate um, insects. They were fighting in the jungles in uh, places like Okinawa or so forth. They would you know, go in and try to clear out the jungles. After the war, during the Marshall Plan days in Europe, they would go in and spray the ruined areas, the bombed out areas, to try to hold down uh, insect-borne diseases. It was released for commercial sales in this country in 1946. By the 1950s, we were using about 80 million pounds of it a year, and sales were just skyrocketing. Um, nobody really knew what, how exactly it killed insects. We knew it affected their nervous system, but we didn't know exactly how or why. Uh, but it use, this was one of the first uses in the southern pines, jack pines, to eradicate the soft fly. You can see the plane there in the center spraying it. Widespread use in agriculture in the late 1940s onward, since that this was the universal antidote. And there were a whole host of other pesticides. I'm focusing on DDT, but other agents, chemical agents, that were discovered, brought into uh, commercial application very quickly, uh, and used for agriculture and for household purposes, too. And the promotion of these things with the federal government's blessing and the chemical industry that DDT is good for me. You see the, the housewife spraying her kitchen cabinets with DDT. And on the right, this Monsanto ad with uh, the cow and the vegetables and the fruits and everybody singing, DDT is good for me. And these next few illustrations are stills from films that were put out by the agriculture department to promote use of DDT and other pesticides. You see a, a group of women, a couple of women, they're standing as a truck goes by. No problem. You know, this stuff is safe. Uh, this is, is kids in a swimming pool being sprayed with a, what's like a fire hose. He, the, the man using this tank is just spraying these kids. And this, this is the most amazing. If you see the actual film of this, it's just astonishing. These kids are eating lunch, and this truck starts spraying, and the after a while, you can't see the kids anymore because they're just hidden behind this cloud of, of some sort of chemical, presumably DDT, that's being sprayed as they're eating their lunch. Everybody thought DDT was safe. You know, what's not to like? It kills whatever insect it comes into contact with. You can use it without any fear of harmful side effects. What's not to like? Well, not so much. Um, as early as 1945, there were concerns being raised that things were not as rosy with DDT as might be believed. This is really interesting. This is a press release from the Department of the Interior from August 22nd, 1945, Fish and Wildlife Service, about DDT it needs to be used with caution because it's capable of causing considerable damage to wildlife, blah, blah, blah. Well, the person who wrote that news release was none other than Rachel Carson. Uh, people... Scientists, conservationists were becoming very concerned about the potential side effects of DDT. This is a letter from uh, a famous ecologist, Aldo Leopold, to Richard Poe, who was with the National Audubon Society, in which he says, this is the most important issue in conservation that I know of, and it needs a lot more attention than it has received. 
And people were beginning to study the effects of DDT, doing laboratory and field studies, but there were some problems with that. It's very difficult to study. Uh, field testing was often confused and puzzling. Birds, after all, they won't stay around an area. They, they've got the ability to fly. So if an area was sprayed and birds flew off, how do you measure what's happened to them? Or did they leave because of the spraying, or did they leave for some other reason? Sprayers were notoriously bad about keeping records about where they sprayed. They sprayed pretty much wherever they felt like. They didn't keep good records of how much was applied. Uh, there were f few areas by the late 1940s and early 1950s, or actually very few areas that were sterile. So many areas had been sprayed that it was very hard to tell what was clean and what wasn't, what was the before and what was after. Um, there, was, there were indications that DDT spraying, aerial spraying, killed not just insects, but pretty much anything. But, you know, a lot of conflicting evidence there. So a lot of scientific studies were being done. And as these studies were being done and they continued, there was a lot of increasing evidence that, that uh, this was toxic to insects, certainly, but also to other fauna and also flora. Uh, actually, one of Leopold's students, who became a famous ornithologist in his own right, Joseph Hickey, wrote a pioneering study for the Wilson Bulletin in 1961 talking about the effect of insecticides on birds living in the Midwest. He shows there that um, the effects of uh, insects were very high. Uh, I'm sorry, effects of DDT were very high when uh, birds living near apple orchards came into contact with it. Hickey went on to do real pioneering research after Silver Spring, uh, after Silent Spring, excuse me, on uh, eggshell thinning, particularly with peregrine falcons. Um, in 1958, a woman named Olga Huckins, somebody who was actually an acquaintance of Carson's, wrote a letter to the Boston Herald talking about how aerial spraying of DDT had killed songbirds. And she, uh, she went out to her yard and found dead birds. And um, she sent a copy of this to Carson and said, can you do something, please? And that convinced Carson, among other things, that, that this, was, this was really a topic that needed the attention it deserved. And ironically, back in 1945, I showed you that news release, she actually had sent a prospectus to the Reader's Digest outlining an article that she hoped to write about the effects of DDT and Re uh, Reader's Digest decided it wasn't of interest to anybody and wouldn't be published. But that's an important point too because one of the charges leveled against Carson was that she somehow acted like she had discovered the harmful effects of DDT in 1962. Well, she did no such thing. It's something she had been tracking actually for, for many years before that. But she had been planning to write a book about the atmosphere and about clouds. She was really looking to do something else, but she became so concerned about the effects of pesticides, particularly after this letter from this friend of hers, that she decided she would write a book about it. She was the unlikeliest of warriors, a woman who was uh, soft-spoken, very shy, certainly not a publicity seeker. Uh, the last person you expect to become a, uh, a Jeremiah, somebody who is crying out. But she took on that role and spent four years doing meticulous research. She had a network of people all over the country sending her information. She knew them from the Fish and Wildlife Service or from other areas, and, and she relied on them to send her information. She gathered up every scientific study she could find. In 1962, New Yorker magazine serialized, began serializing Silent Spring, and the book was published in September 1962. Um, this brief quote here from Lauren Isley, uh, called it a devastating, heavily documented, relentless attack among, upon human carelessness. Um, you know, if it's not a pleasant book to read, if it's not like the sea around us, it's because she has courageously chosen at the height of her powers to educate us upon a sad and unpleasant and a beautiful topic. Um, the book opened with a very famous fable for tomorrow in which she talked about this mythical town was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. She goes on to describe it as this beautiful, pristine place. 
Everything is kind of connected. Then a strange blight crept over the area, and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. And she goes on to describe this community that essentially died. All the birds had vanished, and it was silent. No witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in this stricken world. The people had done it themselves. What has already silenced the voices of spring in countless towns in America? This book is an attempt to explain. So this book was a call to arms. A call to arms to people about what the chemical industry wasn't telling them, about what the government wasn't telling them, about what they needed to know about the stuff that was being indiscriminately sprayed all around us and the effects that that was having on wildlife and ultimately on us. She talked about this obligation to endure, that the right to know this, we have a right to know this, and we have a demand to know it because it's only by knowing that we can endure. You know, we as citizens have it in our power to demand answers, to demand to know what is being done to us. It's the only way we're going to survive. Well, the publication of the book triggered a firestorm. The chemical industry was up in arms. Uh, as you say, silent spring is now noisy summer. By the summer of 1962, after the serialization in New Yorker and then with the book being published, the chemical industry tried to squelch the publication, tried to bring suit against the publisher for libel and so forth. They went ahead and published it to their credit. Uh, but this was front page in every newspaper in the country. Uh, and Carson suddenly becomes this public figure. You know, the least, the last thing she wanted was to be uh, out there, but she took that mantle on. And as I said at the outset of this talk, she also, by the way, had contracted breast cancer and was fighting breast cancer, had a double mastectomy, had the cancer was metastasizing, and she was very, very ill. And yet she felt that she had to do this. With whatever ounce of life she had left, she had to do this. So she starts giving interviews. She, uh, she's interviewed by Bill Moyers, for example, um, and um, Eric Severide. Uh, the chemical industry pushes back. This is a Monsanto publication called The Desolate Year, which does a fable for tomorrow describing a town in which there are no pesticides and insects take over and wipe out life because they're unchecked. That was just one example of an attack. And these attacks got really vicious, really nasty. Rachel Carson had never married. She was a spinster. There's some question about whether or not she was a lesbian. Um, she certainly had some very close friends. But the chemical industry talked about her being a spinster in ways that suggested that there was something inherently wrong with her. She was accused of being a communist, of being anti-capitalistic, and, and just vilified in the, the press. But she had some really powerful allies on her side. No less than John Kennedy, President Kennedy, talked about her book at a press conference and said that he was ordering a White House panel to review all of the evidence about pesticides. And they published their report in May of 1963 and essentially said that everything that Carson said was true. She herself testified before Congress in July of 1963. You can see how swollen her face is from the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy. Uh, but she gave riveting testimony. And people like Abraham Ripikoff, who had been totally against her, turned because of what she said. In the fall of 1963 and into 1964, there were a series of massive fish kills on the Mississippi, along the Gulf Coast, along the eastern seaboard. And it turned out when fish were autopsied that their bodies were laced with chemicals, with pesticides. As she had said. The runoff from agricultural chemicals was getting into the water supply. It was a vindication for her that millions of fish were dying. But she herself couldn't 
derive much comfort for it. In April 1964, after her three-year struggle with cancer, she died at her home in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, and so the voice of Silent Spring was silenced. So some legacies. Uh, David Dominic, this comes out of your wonderful master's thesis about your time with the EPA. I mean, you know better than anybody. The environmental revolution was fueled in part by growing evidence, starting with the groundbreaking work of Rachel Carson that warned both decision makers and the general public that the results of man's pollution of the planet endangered the very health and longevity of the human race. Earth Day, April 1970, comes right out of this. Uh, the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency by legislation in July of 1970 becomes uh, December 2nd, 1970. Uh, as uh, Jack Lewis says, the EPA today may be said without exaggeration to be the extended shadow of Rachel Carson. Uh, the Clean Air Act of 1970 and the Clean Water Act two years later. And the ban of domestic uses of DDT in 1972. You see from that chart how the sales of DDT had been climbing and then dropped off. It's still being used around the world, but only with very, very special permitting can it be used in this country. And data continues to accumulate to show that everything that she said was true. This is from 1975, the chart here about uh, review of data on finding supporting administration's ban of DDT widespread reproductive failures to many avian species. No other chemical found to cause the degree of thinning of eggshells caused by DDT. Carcinogenic effects of DDT, on and on and on. And yet the attacks against her continued and continue to this day. This is a book that was published last year to mark the 50th anniversary of Silent Spring, published by the Cato Institute, called The False Crises of Rachel Carson, and it essentially attacks her for all the old chestnuts, for uh, uh, being a hysteric, being a, uh, uh, an anti-capitalistic warmonger, uh, for being unscientific, all those things. It's perhaps telling that the book was actually not published. It was available as a PDF because, frankly, nobody, no press would touch it. You know, it's been so overwhelmingly demonstrated that what she said is true, that you know, who would who'd buy this? But the legacy, her legacy, is not finished. This wonderful quote from E.O. Wilson in the 45th anniversary. Today we understand better than ever why we must press the effort to save the environment all the way home, true to the mind and spirit of the valiant author of Silent Spring. We need to bring that sense of humility, that sense of wonder, that sense of awe, but also that sense of action we need to bring those things to bear. We can make a difference. You know, every individual can make a difference. And never underestimate the power of one woman or one individual to change the way we view the world. And I'll end with a very brief quote. Going back to uh, the sense of wonder. What is the value of preserving and strengthening the sense of awe and wonder? This recognition of something beyond the boundaries of human existence? Is it the exploration of the natural is the exploration of the natural world just a pleasant way to pass the golden hours of childhood? Or is there something deeper? I am sure there is something much deeper, something lasting and significant. Those who dwell as scientists or laymen among the beauties and mysteries of the earth are never alone or weary of life. Whatever the vexations or concerns of their personal lives, their thoughts can find paths that lead to inner contentment and to renewed excitement in living. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is symbolic as well as actual beauty in the migration of the birds, the ebb and flow of the tides. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature. What will sustain me in my last moments is an infinite curiosity as to what is to follow. The lasting pleasures of contact with the natural world are not reserved for scientists, but are available to anyone who will please himself or herself, who will place himself or herself under the influence of earth, sky, and sea 
and their amazing life. So there it is. There's a call to all of us to go out and rediscover that sense of wonder, that sense of humility, and find within ourselves the steely determination that she had to fight the battles that need to be fought, to make a difference for ourselves, for our children, and for the sake of our planet. Thank you. be happy to uh, to answer a few questions yeah do you have a question okay are there any questions yes oh. You know, we we didn't. We uh, we acted foolishly naive. It's it's just like the people who had flocked to the Nevada deserts to watch the uh, atomic bomb tests, and uh, you know, you know, and and a sense that the government would never tell us what wasn't. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, they are all nonfiction. There, there's not. Uh, I, I'm yes, uh, absolutely. They are all, um, all, of, all nonfiction. All, you know, the Silent Spring in some ways was a departure because it is such a, a Jeremiah. You know, the others are are more like um, uh, introductions to the world around us. The uh, Silent Spring is, is not like the others, and it really is. It's a very angry book. But, but it's absolutely, it's not a work of fiction, and, um, and none of them. They're, they're, they're very real, very powerful. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the uh, one of the effects of DDT is that it causes, it gets into the you know it's very toxic and it builds up in the liver and it builds up in the bodily tissues, and it uh, it stays there and it causes problems with uh, with hormones uh, hormonal releases, with uh, you know with glandular so forth with metabolism and and particularly with birds, with uh, female birds, it plays havoc with their ovaries, their eggshells thin, and the membranes thin out, and the embryos are not viable. And so, yes, uh, the, the, the aquatic birds' water was a real, also like a magnet for DDT. And so seabirds, birds would live in water, and water birds would, would be really prey to this, but then so would the birds that feed on them. The eagles, the osprey, the hawks would develop enormous concentrations of DDT in their own bodies. And then their own eggshells would become thinned. Yeah, question back there. Yeah, go ahead. Well, there's no question. I, I believe the first to admit I'm not an expert on Agent Orange. But, but yeah, we... We tend to rush in with this sense that we're doing the right thing and without really concern about the consequences, particularly during wartime. I mean, frankly, if we kill Viet Cong with Agent Orange, who's going to care? I mean, we're at war against them. But, but the residual effects, the long-term effects of Agent Orange, there are parts of Vietnam that are still terribly, con and Laos and Cambodia that are terribly contaminated with Agent Orange. And there are veterans who carry enormous concentrations of it in their bodies. So, yeah, there, David. Sure, please. Do you want to come up here and do that uh, so people can hear? Okay.
that, as you've said, David, that, that it was really the chemical industry that was the pesticide lobby. But, but there were also growers, agricultural producers who certainly didn't want to have this banned. It was a, it was a tough fight. And it's kind of echoes today of challenges with gun control and the NRA. Uh, of course, the, one of the differences there is that the government was not banning. There were, there were no bans on government studies. In fact, government research going back to the 1940s at places like Patunxet, I alluded to this, really were, were instrumental in showing that there were grave reasons for concern about DDT. And those findings were published. Carson accumulated. She synthesized a lot of things. She didn't, she didn't do a lot of original research on her own, but she synthesized a lot of information that was available and wrote it other people were doing the same thing. There were other books published about the same time about DDT, but she brought to it an eloquence, a passion, again, this, this sense of wonder and humility that inspired her, that this anger. You read some of the other books, and they're very dry. It's like textbooks about why DDT is bad, but hers, you just from the get-go, you were caught up in this book that was just angry, angry, angry. And, uh, and it's so powerful because of that, because her anger is so so visceral, so profound, her outrage at what we are doing. I, you can't read that without feeling caught up with that sense of outrage that she had. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. History of technology, they, they call it truck. That, uh, not, not motor truck, but truck is what accompanies, it's like the unintended consequences of anything. And, and there's really no technology that doesn't carry consequences with it. But the faith in progress, the faith in uh, science blinds people, this kind of goes back to, it blinds people to, to those bad effects. We want so much to believe that science will save us that we're willing to overlook a lot and, and risk a lot. And Carson is saying, you can't do that. You know, we are part of this earth. We ourselves, we contain the same things that make up the earth. It's incumbent upon us to be good stewards of this planet. So one more, two more questions, one more. Yeah. It would be, well, absolutely, we, there is that sense of amnesia, that sense of uh, whether it's conscious or unconscious that we, we forget. But, you know, it'd be interesting to see, I, I, right away, as you were talking, I'm sure other people were thinking this too, we're, we're thinking about global warming and climate change. And we can argue all we want about the causes of global warming, but there's no denying that it's here. I mean, we can, we can see the effects. And whether we have reached a tipping point, whether history will show 50 or 100 years from now that in 2011, 2012, we passed a divide of some sort. And, uh, you know, the effects are very pronounced. We don't see birds dropping from the sky like we did with Silent Spring. But we see our s coastal cities being devastated we see areas of the country that are experiencing droughts, the likes of which they've not seen before. We can measure the disappearance of glaciers. We can measure the fur farther northward expansion of species that 20 years ago were tropical. And we can see these things happening all around us. Aldo Leopold 
talked about paying attention to the cycles and rhythms of nature, as Carson would have. And she talks about how we, we are part of these natural rhythms. When we start to tinker with them, when the rhythms get out of balance, you know, it's at our peril. And we can't be amnesiac. We can't be uh, putting our head in the sand. We have to be alert. We have to ask why. We have to ask what's being done to stop this. And we need to speak out. You know, we all need heroes. We need people like you to make a difference, to stand up and say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to take this anymore. I want to know what's being done to me, what's being done to my planet. It's incumbent on all of us. That's the ultimate message, I think, that you can't just go out and enjoy nature and kind of a la, 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 nature's great. You have to understand that being in nature, it means that you are acknowledging we are part of it. And it's up to us to make sure that we don't destroy it through our ignorance and through our greed and through our uh, blindness, our willful blindness to everything that... Uh, is detrimental. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the people I would recommend, if you don't know him, is Bill McKibben, who uh, wrote a book called The End of Nature, which is about climate change. It was published about, I'm going to say about maybe 15 years ago now, maybe longer than that. But it's very much in the vein of Silent Spring. It's, it's a very powerful book about what well, even then were signs that our planet was undergoing catastrophic environmental change. And it's still very timely today. He clearly was inspired by her. You know, Al Gore, people can lampoon him, but he himself is somebody who is trying to synthesize what is out there, is somebody that I think is very powerful. Um, there are other nature writers who I think bring a sense of passion, a sense of humility to their writing, um, but those are two that come to mind. Maybe people can maybe certainly recommend others. I, I will be the first to admit I'm not, uh, I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be about some of these things. But you can't go wrong if you read McKibben or if you read uh, Gore, uh, others like that. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. And do we know the topic for the next? Uh, we don't, but um, our next series, our next lecture is going to be the first Thursday next month. We, we aren't sure of who the speaker will be at this time. It'll be a surprise, but it will be good, I promise you. And I look forward to seeing all of you next month.